All right, folks. So let's get into like some real serious stuff here. Um, I'm not going to go out, like not that kind of serious, but like let's let's really get kind of serious and talk about natural selection. Um, so of course, can't talk about natural selection unless you're talking about the man, Charles Darwin. Oh, my head's blocking his cute little cartoon here, where he doesn't look like a scary old man. Excuse me. That's all right. So. Charles Darwin really wrote about evolution in 1859. His book about it, um, his famous one, is on the or origin of species. Um, and it's like the book about evolution. Um, so, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about him. He wasn't this always an old, bald, scary man. He was a young, starting to go bald, not that scary man. Sorry, Charles Darwin, that's tough. To have like a, like that hairline. Sorry, buddy. Um, he probably doesn't care because he's like a famous scientist. So I guess he just has like super confidence, which is cool. Let me tell you about him. Um, so he was young, like in his early 20s, and he was invited to go on a trip around the world. I mean, I guess it, it's more common for people, I guess, in the 1800s than it is today. Whatever. I haven't gone on a trip around the world yet. I'm not jealous or anything. Anyway, so he was a naturalist, a scientist, a naturalist you could think of like a biologist. And he always liked looking at like different creatures. And he was struck by the differences between creatures from like the mainland and on islands. He was also struck by how there are creatures that were on other opposite sides of the world that looked really similar. That weren't, you, you could tell they're not the same creature. They're not like related. But they looked so much alike. Like, for example, the flying squirrel and the sugar glider. They look a lot alike. They are not closely related at all. That's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So um, one of the places, he was on this ship called the Beagle. Okay. One of the places he visited were the Galapagos Islands. So when you hear examples or when you, like, see somebody say, oh, the Galapagos Islands, or you see it on a test, they're talking about natural selection, evolution, Darwin. Just giving you a life pro tip if you're like studying for tests and stuff, or if you need to know what islands he went to, the Galapagos. So um, some of the things he looked at there were finches, little, which are like little birds, and he also looked at turtles. He looked at other stuff too, but like those are like two of the main like really big ones that he looked at. And he no noticed there's like a, a turtle species that was in South America. It was very similar to the one on the island, but the one on the island was much, much bigger. And the other thing was... Um, Turtles on the, this little cluster of islands, some of them, they, they just were all really well adapted to life on the island. Like some of them had rounded shells and would just eat stuff off the ground, like grasses and stuff that were growing off the ground. Some of them had these like like weird saddle shaped uh, shells where they could kind of stretch their necks out and reach the tops of these cactus pads that they would eat because there wasn't other food on the island besides cactus. So he was like, they're really specially adapted. Then he looked and he thought he found all these different species of finch. And he was like, these are all finches. It's just a finch, kind of like the mainland South American finch. Well, why do they look so different? Some of them have these big fat beaks. Some of them have like long beaks. Some of them are on the cactus. Some of them are on the ground. Some are in the trees. Some of them eat worms. Some of them eat seeds. Why, why are they so different? So that really got him thinking. Uh, and so before I continue on with Charles Darwin, I have to like mention, uh, you know, my friend, and by friend, I mean other person that I've read about, whose name is Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace also lived around the same time as Darwin. I, I have to look, but I think he might be a little bit younger than Darwin. Um, and so Darwin, we'll just say, like wrote a paper about what he was thinking that Alfred Wallace read. Well, Wallace was kind of a cool guy. Uh, I, I picture like the the old like rich people in the 1800s having this big dark library and then you see like a big lion head up there and like a bunch of like animals and like a bunch of like butterflies pinned up to something which is just kind of creepy okay but um so where did they get all those animals well Alfred Wallace was um a person who would go out and collect rare animal and insect specimens and sell them to collectors um so he went on different various trips and he noticed a lot of the same things Darwin had said, and he was kind of thinking, huh, you know, what that guy Charles Darwin had written about, it kind of stuck with me, and I, I think that I see what he was talking about, and he started to write about his findings. Um, so, so there's Wallace. 
He's got a bunch of like different animal skins and all this other stuff and little bugs that he's collected. Um, and he's on this boat going home and the boat catches on fire and the boat sinks and he loses all his animals, all the bugs, all his notes. So he goes back to England like, oh, man, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm... And then six months later, there he goes back on a boat to do it again. Um, and he wrote to Darwin and he said, hey, I really like what you wrote about, about creatures being different on islands, for example. And Darwin had kind of written like, the idea that living things change over time wasn't new at this time, but nobody knew how it happened. Why? Because you can't get order and niceness like this lovely cup from chaos. I can't throw this cup on the ground, smash into a million pieces. I could do that. I'm not going to, but I could do that. And then I'd have like a broken cup and like a bunch of pieces. I can't take those broken pieces and smash them and end up back with a cup. That cannot happen. You can't get orderly things from randomness and chaos. It's one of the laws of the universe. You cannot, you can't do that. Okay. Well, okay. So people saw, all right, well, it seems like creatures are born with random differences. How are they so well suited to everything? Can't just be from randomness. So nobody knew how things, like the mechanism that caused things to change over time. But Wallace and Darwin kind of both came up with it around the same time. So Wallace wrote to Darwin and said, hey, I like your idea. I think blah, 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 blah. And Darwin was like, oh, crap. This guy's got a really good idea. And I, I haven't published my, my book yet. Um, so... Darwin went ahead and published his book. Even though he was really nervous, he was worried that people were going to not like what he had to say. And they didn't. People still don't. Um, but, so yeah, Darwin gets all the credit. Poor Alfred Wallace. That's my friend. Is he really myself? No. No, that's sarcasm. No. But, um, in my heart, he's my friend. Okay? He's my friend in my heart. Alright. So, Darwin and, and Wallace are credited with coming up with this idea of natural selection. Nature is what decides what's going to survive. Okay, well, let's kind of look into that. How does it work? Well, okay, well, Darwin and Wallace noticed, and other people noticed too, obviously, animals seem to be really specially adapted to their environments. Think of like a walking stick. I mean, it wouldn't really fit in the desert, but in like a forest, you're like, if, unless someone pointed it out to you, you might not notice it. Okay, it seems to be extremely specially adapted to its environment. Or an Arctic hare, whose hair turns white. They get a white coat that comes in in the winter. They blend in with the snow. And they have thick fur. Well, they they wouldn't do well in desert either, huh? Um, so animals seem and plants seem very specially adapted to their environments. So how did this come about? Okay, let's let's try to piece this together. Well, when living things have offspring... All those babies have differences or variation. The good, okay, I use good in quotes because we might say it's good, like, yeah, it's good that the animal survived, but it's, these things aren't good or bad. They're all neutral in that sense. But the variations that help those creatures survive, like having maybe a white coat, for example, um, those bunnies survive and got to eat and, and hide and reproduce. And the ones that didn't produce like a thick white coat, well, they died off. Okay, so that's the bad variation. Nature selects what traits are good in that area and which are bad. Okay, so there's not like a person or anyone saying, okay, well, I like this white one over here. Let's keep that one. No, that brown one. No. Maybe over here in this forest. No, it's nature that selects that. So let's just take a look. Of course, my head's in the way. Big surprise. Um... Let's take a look at this series of pictures, and we'll kind of get an idea. So we have a hawk. We have these rock pocket mice, and they're in different colors. So in this area of the dunes, the dunes are dark colored. In another area, they are lighter colored. Well, a hawk's there, and it's going to eat. And, oh, it ate some of them. Now, you might notice it ate these tan ones. Well, why didn't it eat the gray ones? Do the gray ones taste bad? No. It, they just happen to blend in better. Okay. Do they get to choose to blend in? No. Do you get to choose? Well, I guess we can sort of choose our hair color if you want to dye it. But do you choose the hair color you were born with? No, I didn't either. I didn't choose to have an awesome mustache, but I do. Okay. 
look, I gotta find some way to be silly, especially when I'm over here by myself. Okay, so me and my leave me and my mustache alone. All right. So no, the hawk didn't just decide. Okay, well I'm just gonna eat the the tan ones because they taste better. No, they're the ones that he could most easily see and capture. And then later, of course my head's in the way, my mustached head. Um, we're gonna see more gray ones. Why? Well, they were they lived. They could reproduce. So of course there's gonna be more. Um, let's take a look at another example. I'm just gonna figure a new place to put my head. Maybe up in the top corner from now on. All right. So how does natural selection occur? Let's kind of go through this little little bit here. Living things like these bunnies produce more offspring than can survive. Okay. So. Um, we talked when we talked about ecology about limiting factors. We talked about um, carrying capacity of the environment. Well, if there's like a hundred bunnies that the forest can hold, and there's already like 90 of them, and these bunnies have babies, well, all of a sudden we're going to have like 150, 160 bunnies in the forest. And you're like, woof, that's a lot. You know, th the forest can't carry that many bunnies. There's just not enough food. Well, they're they're going to survive some and some are going to die which i know sounds really sad but it's just how it is it's not a, a good or bad thing it just is a thing okay so all the offspring have variation all the offspring are a little bit different from their parents i know three of them look kind of a lot of like mommy and daddy um but maybe they have their own little differences maybe they're a little faster a little fatter or something some are small some are big some are light or dark just random differences. You can see that in families. Like you can have mom and dad have four kids and they all look different unless they're like identical twins. And even after some time, identical twins look a little different. And if you don't think that, you don't know identical twins. Like I remember my friends Mark and Scott from high school. Um, you could definitely tell them apart. Scott was cool. I mean, Mark, Mark was cool too. Mark, if you ever hear this, you're cool too. But Scott was my better friend. And like you could tell them apart like very easily. I thought and they were identical. Anyway, back to the real world. Um, so these living creatures have variations, small differences that make them unique. Okay, Why? Well, the mom and dad's DNA came together and created, in this case, five unique bunnies. Okay, They're not going to be exactly the same as the mom and dad. Okay, Just like you're not exactly the same as your brothers or sisters, if you have any. All right, so these living creatures are going to compete for limited resources. And you know what? Some are just going to be better than others at finding food, finding a mate, finding shelter, just by their variation that they were born with. Like maybe let's say one was born white, and this is in a wintry area. This area is starting to just get a lot more snow. So maybe this one that's got some white fur that comes in just does a little bit better at hiding from like this fox predator than the others, or a lynx predator or something. So that one survives and some of the others maybe all the others die out so the ones with the best suited for the environment variations adaptations they're going to survive okay that's step one live step two that's really important this natural selection thing is reproduce you could be the world's greatest bunny you could be the strongest i, I eat all the carrots i'm gonna i'm like i'm bugs bunny but if you don't reproduce doesn't matter. You didn't pass those genes on to the next generation. So in, in biological terms, what's the point? What's your point? You might have been great, but you, you, you didn't pass those traits on. So those awesome traits are gone. Good work. Come on. Anyway. Anyway, but you can see too how being a white bunny would be a disadvantage in a, a forest where they don't get a lot of snow. You can see that bunny probably for a long way. But if it's in an Arctic region, where there's lots of snow, yeah, that bunny's going to blend in a lot better than a brown one. Okay, so these organisms have to be well adapted for that environment. So that's the idea of natural selection. Nature is going to select. I know I don't, it's, nature isn't a thinking, feeling thing, but just the difficulty of surviving in nature is going to select which ones survive and which ones don't. And those are going to be able to pass that DNA on and pass those good traits, good for that environment, traits on to the next generation. So that's it for natural selection. We'll kind of talk about some other stuff. Oh, actually, let me add something to the end of this video here. Let's talk about phylogenetic trees. This is kind of an important thing to kind of mention. 
A phylogenetic tree, sometimes they're called cladograms, depending on how they're arranged. They show how closely living things are related and when they shared a most recent common ancestor. So like ostriches and birds. Here where it's got this number six, that's where they shared the most recent common ancestor. You can tell that ostriches and hawks and other birds are more closely related aside from how they look. But because their little letter U or sometimes it looks like a little letter V is small, like a hawk is kind of far re removed related from a mammal. Because the last time they shared our recent common ancestor, we have to go and we have to look at where those two lines connect. So let's see, mammals goes down to this three and the hawks and other birds connect at that number three. That's where they shared a most recent common ancestor, just kind of a, a while ago. So this is like going back in time. This is like today. Um, so it shows that the closer the connection, the closer they're related. The farther the connection, the farther they're related. And the farthest back, like this one over here, this lungfish, that's like the most primitive creature. It's the least changed over time. So it's the one where the branch doesn't change and branch out into anything else. Um, so I just wanted you guys to see that and be aware of it. Okay, so the closer the little connector, the U or the V, if we see another one, you'll see it looks kind of like a V. Um, the closer that is together, the more closely they're related. Okay, so we could say like mammals um, are not that closely related to hawks, like a hawk and other bird. It's more closely related to a crocodile than a mammal because they share a common ancestor more recently at five instead of three. Okay, so that was natural selection and a bonus learning about phylogenetic trees. So I hope that helps clarify things for you, and I'll see you later. Bye! Bye!